go to our sermon, our preaching time, let me have you to open your Bibles to two places as we get underway. Two places in the New Testament. Luke chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 7. I'll give you a few moments to find those two chapters. Luke 12 and Matthew chapter 7. And let's begin reading uh, in Luke 12, verses 16 through 21. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Now look over, if you will, at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. And here we'll just read verses 24 through 27. Beginning of there at verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Today I want to bring a sermon I call The Ways of a Fool. The Ways of a Fool. The Bible tells us there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 16, 25. That verse begins with a singular, a way, and concludes with a plural, the ways. You say, well, why is that? Why does he switch that way? Well, in a sense, it's all the same. People can be foolish again, uh, toward the things of God, towards the truth they, they know better about, uh, and still veer off from it. And so all of those ways really are one and the same. They're all leading someone in the same direction. So whether it's a plural or a, sing, a collective singular, um, I want to talk to you about the ways of a fool. Here in these texts, the Lord Jesus illustrates the ways of fools by showing how short-sighted they are. They think only of themselves and this present life, and they're not making preparations for eternity. And he said of one, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And the other he called a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand, disregarding the words of God. He made the foundations of his life out of things that could easily disappear or be taken away from them without any warning. You don't want to do that in your life. You don't want to do that. Christ said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Matthew 24, 35. So let me consider some of the ways that fools reject the truth. And I'll give you the text as we go, so you won't need to turn to each one of them. But uh, we'll take them in their scriptural order as we go. So point number one, there is what I call the royal fool. The royal fool. 1 Samuel 26, verse 21. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because thy, my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. Saul was the first king over Israel, and that sudden elevation to prominence and power seduced him. He didn't want to give it up. He didn't want to lose it. 
Uh, but when he couldn't defeat the Philistines and he couldn't get any light uh, going to the, uh, the witch at Endor and contacting Samuel, which he wasn't expecting to do, and when his armies were in a standoff against the Philistines because of Goliath the giant, uh, along comes a shepherd boy named David who wasn't even in the army, and he takes down the giant with a slingshot. And uh, after Israel defeated the Philistines that day, and the troops and King Saul and all of his uh, representatives are traveling with him to go back to the city, he hears the women of the city singing folk songs about David. Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. Talk about hyperbole, a little like exaggeration. But um, Saul became jealous. He became so jealous he couldn't let it go. Even after he gave his, his daughter's hand in marriage to David, he still wanted to kill David. And uh, when he was pursuing David, and David had opportunity to kill Saul, and even his own men urging him to do so, he wouldn't do it. Because he honored and respected the king that God had appointed. Whether he was a good man, whether he's a, a great king or not, God had appointed him to be king over Israel. And the lesson of Saul's foolishness is that just because someone else receives praise or they receive accolades that you didn't receive doesn't mean they're out to get you. It doesn't automatically mean they're out to get you. Now, in time, Saul became a disappointment and God rejected him from being king and he did make David king after him. But it wasn't David's doing, it was God's doing. And the, the lesson is that just because someone else receives praise that you didn't receive doesn't mean they're out to get you. And it'll destroy you worrying about it. Secondly, there is the atheistic fool. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. And Psalm 53, verse 1, restates this verse verbatim. The Greek word agnostic, you take the word gnostic, that's someone who has knowledge about a particular subject, and you add the alpha, the A, in front of it, and it reverses the meaning, turns it into a negative. So an agnostic is someone who does not have definite knowledge about anything, specifically the knowledge about God's existence. So they are an agnostic. The Latin word, which means the same thing, is ignoramus. Those two words are synonyms. Look them up in your English dictionary. But uh, the verse, our verse, Psalm 14, verse 1, says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He may, with his lips, say, Oh, sure, I believe in God, and uh, act like he does. But in his heart, there's a struggle going. He's not sure about it. And the Bible tells us a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. James 1, verse 8. If there's a gourmet dinner, there must have been a chef. If there was a building or a house, there must have been a building contractor and a construction crew. If there is a car, there must have been an engineer and a planner, a designer. And if there is reality, there must be a God who made it all. The universe operates with such predictable mathematic precision in the movement of planets and, the, and its motion that you'd have to be a fool to say it all came about by random chance on its own. The fool hath said in his heart and with his lips, there is no God. Uh, won't it be a shock to an atheistic fool who dies one day and he suddenly wakes up in hell in fiery torment, not because of his sins, but because he died without having trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the necessary uh, element. That's the thing that determines where you spend eternity. But because he rejected Christ, he even and, and then he realizes he even denied God's existence. The Lord Jesus said, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Matthew 12, verse 37. 
And the Bible tells us, He that cometh to God must believe that He is. Hebrews 11, verse 6. So don't be an atheistic fool. Don't be an agnostic. Have absolute certainty and certitude and confidence that God exists and God uh, wants to do something for you that no one else in the world can do. He wants to forgive your sins. He wants to write your name, uh, make sure your name is recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life and can never be erased. And uh, you'll live with Him for all of eternity. And He'll buy, He's, he's sends the Holy Spirit as His abiding presence in you 24 hours a day. And He's given you a book that you can have 100% confidence and, re and rely, about, rely upon. Thank God for the Bible. Thank God for the King James Bible. Now, thirdly, there is what I call the perverted fool. This is Proverbs 7, verse 22. Proverbs 7, verse 22. He goeth after her straightway, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. This describes a young man who is following after his flesh, and he ventures into the bad neighborhoods of town so he can mess around with hookers and prostitutes. That's what Solomon's describing. Every big city has those areas, those street corners. In fact, on my way to work every day, I just go down to Holt Avenue, and it's a very direct route to my job. And once you get into Pomona, or as the gangbangers call it, P-Town, once you get into P-Town, uh, there are certain corners along the street and two or three times a week I'll be heading to work seven in the morning and there's one girl there a couple of girls over there two or three girls I've seen as many as four prostitutes standing on one street corner hoping to catch the attention of drivers and passers-by she may look pretty on the outside and be attracted to you at first she may talk to you like you're the only man in the world hey I, how are you I like your car you know I like your sunglasses those are really they look great on you are you looking for a date? You need, you need some company or some such thing? And it might seem like fun and games and, and you think you're getting away with something until you wake up with VD or you have herpes, some uh, sexually transmitted disease. They almost describe it with, as though it's attractive. It's something you want to have. It's not something you want to have. And then you're, and then you're uh, financially poorer on top of it. And you've given up something very valuable that should belong only to your wife, only to your husband, if the, if the reverse is true. And someone says people sacrifice the eternal on the altar of the immediate. You don't want to do that. That kind of a fool will have his actions come back to haunt him and stay with him and his medical records for the rest of his life. Fourthly, there is the slanderous fool. Proverbs 10, verse 18. He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. The verse says, he that hideth hatred with lying lips. This is someone who lies to you to your face and tells you how much they admire you and what a great person they think you are and how uh, concerned they are about your welfare. But privately, they tell other people what they really think. They live in make-up stories and uh, 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 allegations against you to ruin your reputation, to ruin your character, to denigrate your family, your family's reputation, and so forth. And... Uh, the, com the common expression, every one of you can finish it with me, is what goes around comes around. And I'm thinking right now, over the last month, of a, an example currently in the news, and we've been watching this uh, Judge Kavanaugh and his confirmation process to the U.S. Supreme Court. They finally voted to confirm him to the U.S. Supreme Court yesterday. It should have been done three weeks ago. But um, I'm watching the way this man's character, his family have been threatened, and uh, every vulgar and despicable allegation could be made, was made against him with absolutely no uh, uh, confirming evidence, no confirmation or corroboration to support any of them. And not only does one political party uh, uh, operate that way, but then they have a, a willing uh, news media that repeats the, and regurgitates that stuff. How does a person stand up against that? 
But like they say, what goes around comes around, and they may wake up and realize they made a big mistake. And I'll tell you why. Do you think he's going to soon forget what they did to him? It may make him even more conservative once he gets on the court. I pray to God that it does. Sometimes I wish the, a righteous monarch would just force virtue down the throats of these people. They don't like it. They don't want it. That's why they need it. When I think of, of every abortion clinic that needs to be firebombed, when I think, or I mean uh, shut down, when I think of the, this whole gay marriage thing that needs to be reversed and done away with, when I think about everybody who thinks, you know, how many people die every year because of drunk drivers on the highways of this country? So an idiotic state with idiotic state legislators like California says drunk driving and drunk driving deaths are not enough. We need pot driving deaths. We need pot influenced drivers behind the wheel. And they legalize that. Well, I'd love to take their pot away from them. I'd love to take it away from everybody. And there's certain things uh, only a righteous monarch or a righteous dictator can get away with. You know, George Putnam used to be a, a guy I listened to on the radio. He was, a, he was a very conservative Democrat. And I used to agree with George quite a bit. I think I even called into his radio show one time. I forget what we discussed. But he said, what this country needs is a good dictator for about nine or ten months. Without any uh, obstacles to overcome, without anyone opposing him, to do what's right, to get things back on track, to fix the financial problems in America, uh, and get rid of crime, and get rid of this, that, and the other. And then after everything's running smoothly again, off with his head. Right? <laughs> and then go back to the way things, go back to your democracy, go back to your republic. I thought, George, that's good thinking. But you know what I really want is for Jesus Christ. He's going to do all those things, and a hundred times more. And a hundred times more. But... Uh, Judge Kavanaugh's confirmation process has been a disgrace. The ordeal he and his family have uh, suffered under may all backfire against his accusers, and I pray that it does. For, or point number five, rather, there is the self-centered fool. Proverbs 12, verse 15, tells us, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. This is a man who's blinded by his own faults, and you can't correct him. He's not interested in advice. He's content to do what he wants, and with little regard to the opinions or the concerns of other people. Young people, both young men and young women, can become like this. When you're 13, obviously you know much more than your parents do, right? Uh, some headstrong business uh, executive or business owner can become this way. You can't tell him how to run his business. And in some cases, even a very rigid uh, church pastor can become this way. He's the only one that knows how to do everything right. I don't want your opinions. I just want your obedience. That's the wrong way to be a pastor. <laughs> you want to trust the advice and and consider the observations of people around you. Because you might just learn something along the way. You know how it is? One preacher, one pastor behind the pulpit, he can't give you everything you need to receive from the preaching of the Bible. You have to supplement that with reading the Bible on your own and maybe hear other preachers along the way. Because God gives them something to say that you need to hear. And so, so it is when when uh, you want to consider the opinions, uh, the advice, the, the observations that other people make that maybe you didn't see. But don't, you don't want to be like that, the self-centered uh, kind of fool. Point number six, there is the mocking fool. The mocking fool. Proverbs 14, verse 9. Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. And verse 8, just before that, says the folly of fools is deceit. This person ignores the serious nature and the serious consequences of sin. Let me run down just a brief list of some of the consequences that come 
from sin. Bloodshot eyes, smelly clothes, high blood pressure, stress, dry skin, premature aging, loss of income, bad credit, social rejection, cirrhosis of the liver, lung cancer, throat cancer, nasal cancer, venereal disease, loss of family, loss of children, a loss of their affections, a loss of your job, HIV virus, AIDS, automobile accidents, maybe gunshot wounds or stab wounds, some sleazy reputation that follows you from that point on, jail time, prison time, on top of an arrest record that follows you, a lack of productivity, lack of energy, loss of friends, some court-mandated counseling for one problem or another, unnecessary hospital bills and hospital uh, stays and surgeries, divorce, child uh, support payments, bankruptcy, a perverted outlook on life, and betrayal of your so-called friends. That's just to name a few. All of those are the consequences and the results of sin. You know, when Lot tried to warn his sons-in-law of God's coming judgment, the, the Bible says that he, Lot, seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law, Genesis 19, verse 14. See, they enjoyed reveling and partying with all of their gay friends and their LGBT, QRST, UV, WXYZ friends. <laughs> they enjoyed all of that in Sodom. And when he tried to say, listen, God's going to send judgment, they tried to turn the tables and make him out to be the troublemaker. He's the problem. You're intolerant. But not only these kinds of fools mock at the seriousness of sin, but they mock the goodness of goodness. Right conduct, right behavior, respectful treatment of others, respectful obedience to your parents and any authority. They mock virtues uh, and say that those things are vice. Those things are restrictive. They, they, they keep you from being liberated and doing what you fully want to do. It's like I said recently, if somebody is uh, so fragile, they need to save space because you might say something that hurts my feelings. I'm not going to trust that person to have a driver's license or get on the road because they'll come up to a red light and say, well, I want to go. Here's trying to trigger me with a red light, right? I'm going to react and go, and I'm just going to drive anyway. That's a lot of BS. Barbara Streisand, by the way, that's what Russia, <laughs> Barbara Streisand, BS. But these people not only mock the seriousness of sin, but they mock the goodness of goodness. And point number seven, uh, there is the angry fool. Proverbs 14, verse 17. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. This type of fool can control his temper. He's easily provoked. He finds a reason to be mad at everybody. I don't know why that is, but some people go through life that they seem to enjoy living that way. The polite word is irascible. It's somebody that's very easily angered. And um, I, I, knew a, I knew a minister, and whenever he would come to our, our funeral home during the week to officiate a funeral, and he, of course he didn't know the deceased, but we called him anyway, and he would talk about their life as best as he could, and he said, I would imagine that grandma sometimes was irascible in her demeanor. And he said that, figuring nobody else knows, knows what the word irascible means, but it means someone who's easily angry, they have a hot temper. If they were thinking, they'd say, he just insulted grandma. But he would get away with it. That's a good way to lose friends, to make enemies, and, and be kicked out of the country club, right? <laughs> you have a hot temper. And this type of fool might even sabotage his own chances for success, his own uh, prospects for advancement on the job or getting a raise. He might even sabotage his chance to be of some service or some use to his local church. Because the pastor says, I can't trust that guy. I'm not sure if he's going to explode on the, on the kids in Sunday school, right? And then he'll get angry over that. Point number eight today, there is what I call the disobedient fool. 
Proverbs, Proverbs 15, verse 5. It says, A fool despises his father's instruction, and he that regardeth reproof, uh, rather, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Prudent means to be cautious in careful, and careful in what you do and the decisions you make. A fool ignores the instructions of his father, and the Bible says he despises his own mother later in Proverbs 15, verse 20. If your dad tells you not to start smoking cigarettes, you're a fool if you ignore his advice, his advice and start anyway. If your dad tells you to save your money and only spend it wisely after considering all the possible outcomes, you're a fool if you don't heed that advice and just squander it all. If your father or your mother have their, their reservations, their misgivings, their apprehensions about the, the person you're dating, and you rush into getting married anyway, you might end up miserable having not heeded their advice. You may end up extremely miserable and unhappy. The verse says, he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Reproof means to expose something, bring it out into the open with the hope of making it right again. And, uh, but a fool despises that. He's not interested in that. And lastly, point number nine today, there is what I call, what we call the meddling fool, the meddling fool. Proverbs 20, verse 3. It is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling. To meddle is to intrude, to interfere, especially in things that should be left alone and forgotten. You know, one of the best short little quips uh, in marriage advice is forgive and forget. Don't bring up their mistakes in the past and move forward. And trust that they won't bring yours up either. Uh, but this is the kind of person, even, even some Christians, who have a bad habit of bringing up other people's past sins and not letting them escape it. You know, if a man used to be some heavy drinker, but now he's sober, thank God, he wants to do something for God, a meddling fool will always uh, remind others of his past, not let them forget it, and not let him forget it, try to disqualify him from doing anything for the Lord. Uh, and they, have, they seem to have no understanding of God's wonderful and forgiving uh, grace to sinners. Boy, I'm glad he's gracious to me. And if their own past sins were always brought up, they wouldn't like it at all. And as far as believers go, this kind of a meddling fool, this kind of a Christian, is, is usually someone who's not doing anything for God anyway. They want to tell everybody else how they ought to do it, but they're not doing anything. These things will be manifested one day at the judgment seat of Christ. And they'll discover that they have no extra rewards, no crowns awarded to them for faithful service, nothing to cast at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ one day. And that will expose them to the universe for what they, they truly are. They were meddling fools. The Apostle Paul writes, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. The Apostle Paul had persecuted Christians before he became one. And rather than beat himself up over his own past, uh, which would have achieved nothing for the Lord Jesus Christ, he resolved to do whatever he could to serve God and be pleasing to the Savior who had saved him. So if that's the way a true believer should think, then that's the way other believers should think about him. Give him a chance. Give her a chance. 
Let them, let them begin to grow in grace and knowledge and serve Jesus Christ and do what they can. That new Christian might be able to reach somebody that you can never reach. And vice, ver and, and vice versa. But don't meddle, but minister. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6.2 says, now I'm going to bring this to a close. A fool can be described with one word. That is the word short-sighted. Short-sighted. He doesn't take the long look down the road and see where his actions are going to lead unless he changes course. He thinks he's fine just the way he is. He doesn't need God. He doesn't need Christians. He doesn't need the scriptures. He doesn't need your advice. He doesn't want your input. He doesn't care what his parents think. He doesn't care what his, his close friends think. He doesn't care what his family thinks. He's going to do what he wants to do. And to be truthful with you, that's how everybody operates in life. People find a way to do what they want to do and figure out a way to justify it or rationalize and explain it later on. You don't want to be a fool that proceeds through life that way. Wake up and realize where your action is going to lead. Listen, somebody that, that gets... Uh, cancer or emphysema from being a heavy cigarette smoker thinking he would never get sick is a fool. I mean, he's a first class fool. You only got about 10 million people before you that got lung cancer and died from cancer related uh, uh, diseases through smoking as serve as examples and warning not to do it. But you think you're the exception. People go through life thinking they can do these any number of these things and it won't come back to bite them or haunt them later on. But they're wrong. How much truer should that be of someone who sees the lives of Christians, good Christians? He knows what God offers him through the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows what God wants to do for him and save his soul and cleanse him from the guilt and the stain of his sin and write his name and make sure his name is written in heaven and uh, secure his place there for all of eternity. And you say, well, I'm not interested in that. You're the biggest fool in the universe.